I may not be really just myself, but just one thing that I find fascinating about like, all these different sects that exist at the time would be the cultures. Just hearing about all the ways people from around the world try to explain their surroundings, their worldviews, and their beliefs. You can see how the formation of religious groups like the Abrahamic and the Dharmic religions most society, with the denominations that are diversifying even more the spiritual exploration of the world. Even if you consider it all superstition, it's still a nice window into the mind of the normal human being, who seeks knowledge even when the lack of information hinders all their progress. And then you get to the part of these religions where the people involved actively try to be morons. Uh, okay, um, right. So, creationism. That's a thing. I don't know why there's support for the idea that history began with the Flintstones, but it's a real idea. And inexplicably popular for some reason. The basic idea is that the creation of the universe was orchestrated by a divine being who created many of his aspects, like nature and the earth. Oh, that's one of the most well-known forms of creation myth right there. Find any religion with a creative date in it, like Christianity or some versions of Hinduism, and you'll see this myth in it. So just by that description alone, creationism doesn't sound that crazy, right? In fact, it sounds rather reasonable if you're faithful yourself. Well, there is a catch though. Until now, I was only talking about religious subjects. And creationism is not a religious subject. It's a political one. Or to be specific, a culture war subject. Hi, culture war now for 999 for the after outdated sports teams and various society It comes with many exciting features like political indoctrination, incessant cheerleading, and the ever rewarding fights for new matters. And for the first five colors, they also received the blazing sounds to never be made today t shirt free of charge. Bye now! Modern creationism began around the 19th century with the development of the scientific theory of evolution, spearheaded by the studies of Charles Darwin. Seeing the traditional beliefs strengthened by these new discoveries, reactionary fundamentalists in Europe and the United States responded by pushing a religious narrative that evolution was fake and that the truth was that the Christian God created the universe ages ago, reinforcing a more literal interpretation of the Bible that many religious movements of the time were advocating for. After that, the views held by creationists disbanded, but the overall intent of impulsively hissing at any science that may suggest that you shouldn't base your reality on the thoughts of people who lived thousands of years ago and who thought that a cold was a result of a ghost burp is still very apparent. However, I also want to see how these ways of thinking came to be, so to do that, I think it's necessary to see the precursors of modern creationism and what were their beliefs. Okay, quick heads up. While there are versions of creationism in faiths like Hinduism and Judaism, uh, the more popular versions of it are concentrating in regions of the large amount of Muslim and especially Christian people. The reason why is that although Hinduism and Judaism had their fair share of crazies run amok, they tend to be less fanatical and or influential than their Islamic Christian counterparts. So if I end up explaining more about Christian and Islamic fundamentalism, just know that it's because the other religions can hold their shit together a little bit better. For a long time, a sort of proto-creationism was prevalent in human societies, the common knowledge that the earth was only a thousand years old being prevalent throughout. The earliest known sources of the idea came from ancient Greek philosophers like Anaxagoras and Empedocles, as well as some thinkers the common person actually recognizes like Socrates and Plato, who argued that abstract divine forces had manipulated the universe at its inception, shaping it to their wills. These forces include the mind, love, strife, reason, and many more. It depends on what the Gagelian philosophers back in the day considered the intellectual center of the cosmos. Besides them, Roman statesman and orator Cicero argued in his philosophical work De Natura Deorum on the nature of gods. Now, of all the things which are administrated by nature, the universe is so to speak the originator, begetter, parent, leader, and supporter, and it cherishes and contains them as members and parts of itself. But if the parts of the universe are administrated by nature, the same must be the case with the universe itself. At any rate, there is nothing in the administration of it which can be found fault with, for the best that could have been produced from the elements which there were has been produced. If, then, the things achieved by nature are more excellent than those achieved by art, and if art produces nothing without making use of intelligence, nature also ought not to be considered destitute of intelligence. If at the sight of a statue or painted picture you know that art has been employed, and from the consistent view of the course of a ship feel sure that it is made to move by art and intelligence, and if you understand that looking at a horologue, by one marked out with lines or working by means of water, that the hours are indicated by art and not by chance. With what possible consistency can you suppose that the universe which contains these same products of art and their constructors in all things is destitute of forethought and intelligence? 
This argument is one of the main creationist talking points, which argues that in the same way humans create everyday objects like watches, which gave the argument its name, the watchmaker analogy, so the gods create the universe as we know it. While its logic is weirdly built, with one of the biggest problems with its reasoning being that just because something is complex and obeys a certain set of rules doesn't mean that something was responsible for its creation. With the attempts to attribute a day to it just being wishful thinking from the theists, the rationale was heavily promoted by the Stokes and, more importantly, the Platonists, the latter influencing much of the early Christian church's philosophy. Not only did Christians inherit creationist ideas such as the Greeks' ideas about Nus and Logos, as well as the Jewish chronology of the Bible, but they also passed down to the generations of scholars and religious officials the theological arguments that would be used to this day. It was during the late classical and early medieval ages that an early form of what is now known as gap creationism got popular within church circles, arguing that the earth was created and then fell to chaos in the help of Yahweh to rebuild it in six days after a large gap of time. So far, so good, as even as some of these ideas may seem a bit out there, okay, they don't make a lot of sense, but whatever. Overall, the debates around them tend to focus more on the philosophical and theological aspects of creation. Belief in a young earth was still the norm, but many times theologians would chalk up passages of the sacred scriptures to allegory and metaphor, like Augustine of Hippo in times of Aquinas. It would be a shame if suddenly a lot of people got the idea of taking their sacred tests and interpreted everything in the most literal sense of the word. Before the Reformation increased throughout most of Europe, the newly Protestant theologians began researching religious texts more in depth to answer the questions about the nature of Yahweh, as well as its relation with the universe. Reformers such as Martin Luther and John Calvin revisited Genesis in order to discover information that may have been left unchecked or misinterpreted, at least by non-Catholic interpretations, by the Vatican, preaching more literal reading of the Bible. From commentary in Genesis, Martin Luther says, We conclude that Moses spoke literally and plainly and neither allegorically nor figuratively. That is, he means that the world with all creatures was created in six days as he himself expresses it. If we cannot attain into a comprehension of the reason why it was so, let us still remain scholars and leave all the perceptions shift to the Holy Spirit. While on John Calvin's commentary on the first book of Moses called Genesis, for his two volumes the Calvin to contend that Moses distributes the work which God perfected at once into six days for the mere purpose of conveying instruction. Let us rather conclude that God himself took the space of six days, for the purpose of accommodating his works to the capacity of men. And overall, they say a lot more stuff about Genesis, what they think of every verse means, etc, etc. Et but honestly, this may be a me issue because it's been so long since I've been able to read a full book in a week, but just reading through both of them to find it both close was exhausting, because even in the first chapter, the only thing I got from them was I say Heathens. 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 Anyway, it was also around this time that those interested in the timeline of the Bible started calculating the approximate date of the creation of the world, basing the variables on the ages of the biblical patriarchs, the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah, and other written and known events that could flesh out the chronology better. In 1650, preacher James Usher published his estimates of when creation happened reaching the conclusion that the first day was dated October 23rd, 4004 BC. The Usher chronology became the standard biblical timeline in the English-speaking world. As beyond being similar to other creation estimates like the Hebrew calendar's date of 3760 BCE, uh, Martin Luther's dating of 3927 BC, and even the estimates of natural philosophers, the precursors to modern scientists such as Isaac Newton's date of 4000 BC, and Johannes Kepler's estimate of 3977 BC, the whole sequence of events was heavily featured in the King James Version of the Bible, one of the most important religious books in the Anglosphere. Even with the Renaissance and the subsequent scientific revolution picked up steam, many of the early natural philosophers chose to frame the world around religion, seeking to explain theology with reason. Taxonomist John Ray's definition of a biological species described them as without changing features, so that one species can turn to another, coinciding with the Christian idea of all species being created in the beginning to be immutable. The writings of natural theologians like William Durham and philosophers like Bernard, uh, this, also provided many of the foundations for creationist claims of divine design, especially with the resurgence of the watchmaker analogy and his later popularization by the natural theologian William Paley. However, even with the support of both theologians and natural philosophers, the wave of new scientific discoveries around the 17th and 19th centuries caused the decline of literal interpretations of Genesis among many scientists with prominent philosophers like David Hume clashing against many of the theological truths of the time. 
Arguing that order doesn't automatically mean that there's a designer behind it, Hume denied the theological argument and defended that natural causes affect the world, said that any idea of a god molding the world was more than likely just a human projection of nature. At the same time, improvements in the field of geology provided science that the Earth was much older than previously taught. The deeper the science dug, the more unfamiliar the fossils would be, and the idea that speech has never changed on its head. It was becoming clear to the world that speech could change the new ones and that the old ones could even become extinct, although until the 19th century it wasn't exactly sure why. This, along with political turbulence caused by radical liberal agitation in the American, and especially the French Revolution, started a conflict between traditional religious thought and modern scientific reasoning that continues to this day. The increasing doubts of the reliability of the literal interpretations of creation gave way to new forms of creationism, actual creationism as we understand it today. We quickly noticed the difference the more we explore its history. So, we're faint 6,000 years old anymore. Someone should tell them. What could replace it in this modern world? First off, there was a resurgence of gap creationism as the discovery of an older Earth led credence to the idea that the planet was created by Yahweh after a long time skip, as well as reconciling the Bible with science. At the same time, another form of creationism was getting popular, progressive creationism. Progressive creationism defended the idea that Yahweh came around every once in a while to create new species across the world, kind of like a mini version of evolution without the evolution part. Many who believed in progressive creationism also believed in the day-age theory, which states that the seven days of creation from Genesis were actually long spans of time, uh, accounted for the new scientific theories about the Earth's age. All these types of creationism are part of the larger Old Earth creationism, which overall looked to reconcile old biblical views of the immutable, near unchangeable nature of living beings with the newly accepted scientific age of the Earth of around a few million years. I can imagine they haven't invented yet. These examinations of the creation of the Earth were an attempt to regain control of the faithful's view of the world, with them trying to protect their religious narratives and documents in the face of uncertainty caused by scientific advancements, as well as the social political factors that oppressed many people during that time, providing fertile ground for religious revivals. That will only increase with the publication of Charles Darwin's On the Origins of Species in 1859. After 20 years of studying the connection between many similar species, like the many bird species of the Galapagos Islands, the similarities between barnacles and crustaceans, and the connection between humans and apes, Darwin published his findings on natural selection in 1859, generating significant buzz and discussion about the veracity of his claims. Quick explanation Natural selection is a process in which living beings spread their genetic traits by reproduction based on a random mutation gained by interacting with the environment they live in. For example, in the Galapagos Islands, Darwin observed that the beaks of native birds would be specialized to consume their food depending on the diet of such bird species. If a type of bird was eating nuts, their beak would be suited to eat nuts. If a bird ate fruits, the beak would make it easier to eat fruits, etc, etc. Together with the knowledge that species did change over time, thanks to previous advancements in geology and biology, these finds provide the foundations for the evolution theory, where a species adapts to its environment and mutates over the generations for increased likelihood of survival resulting in small changes to the species in the short run to the potential creation of a new species in the long run. The acceptance of the theory took some time, but after a few years Darwin's findings became recognized by the scientific community, with significant discoveries in genetics and microbiology in the next decades backing up even more the credibility of evolution. This was a major blow for creationist thought, as many religious groups and movements started adopting theistic evolution, a compromise between the religious and scientific views of creation that basically says evolution is real and Yahweh has something to do with it which is the most popular view for religious people nowadays. Throughout the 1860s up to the 1920s, creationism fell in the background of religious discussion as just another talk point with an increasingly heated debates between Christian churches about their doctrines and beliefs. It's not until the start of the 20th century that creationism would come back at full strength, mostly in the United States. But before that, a little more about the late 19th century. As well as creationism's fall from grace, religion itself came under fire from both within and without. Methods of criticism such as higher criticism, or as known today, historical criticism, gained popularity in rationalist and even liberal theologian circles, examining the origins of the religious texts, their historical context, potential original meanings of the texts. Higher criticism was applied to the Bible and it caused quite a stir in Christianity. One volume of essays called Essays and Reviews, okay, correct me, and the academic literature tends to be seen as rather dry and boring, his so written is since I was written as purely informational, with no regards to entertainment, a uh, view I heavily agree with, by the way. Pretty ironic, given how my term paper for graduation is a systematic review, 
AKA, I gotta read a lot of academic, academic shit. Anyway, essays and reviews was released not even four months after Origin of Species, and attacked a little interpretations of the Bible in favor of a more scholarly approach to Bible study. From the most notable essay on the interpretation of scripture by Benjamin Jowett, the book itself remains as a first unchanged amid the changing interpretations of it. The office of the interpreter is not to add another, but to recover the original one, the meaning, that is, of the words as they first struck on the ears or flashed before the eyes of those who heard and read them. He has to transfer himself to another age, to imagine that he is a disciple of Christ or Paul, to disengage himself from all that follows. The history of Christendom is nothing to him, only the scene at Galilee or Jerusalem, the handful of believers who gathered themselves together at Ephesus or Corinth or Rome. The great part of his learning is the knowledge of the text in itself. He has no delight in the volumes of literature which has overgrown it. He has no theory of interpretation. A few rules to get a guardian against common errors are enough for him. His objective is to read scripture like any other book, with a real interest and not merely a conventional one. He wants to be able to open his eyes and see or imagine things as they truly are. Uh, these words were, um, inflammatory? The defense of not just historical criticism, but also other contemporary forms of religious criticism, as well as the arguments about religious beliefs and beyond these, the ethical and social issues of the time like slavery, racial tensions, temperance, traditional values, capitalist success to like poverty, the rich poor gap, internal labor, pollution, industrialization, and holy shit, what was wrong with the late 19th century? More importantly, why is the early 21st century trying to become the 19th century? Anyway, all these factors have to flame the fires of a future schism in American churches. One that created a split between the modernist slash liberal movements which defend the compatibility between science and religion, the adaptation of a religion based on knowledge and moral issues, and the fight for social justice through a Christian lens, and the fundamentalist slash traditionalist movements that asserted biblical and doctrinal authority of traditional values that were against progressive ideas and, the most relevant, were against the scientific developments that were happening during that time. Which includes the denial of evolution. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. During the 1910s, things were coming to a head as the fundamentalists were starting to fight against the teaching of evolution in public education, with the emergence of a new form of creationism called Young Earth Creationism being the vanguard of the movements. Amongst this extreme type of creationism, Young Earth adherents deny both the existence of evolution as well as the scientifically accepted age of the Earth, claiming that Yahweh created the Earth and life 10,000 to 6,000 years ago. Arguing that Darwinism promoted eugenics and survival of the fittest mentalities, as well as claiming that evolution was an atheistic invention that destroyed Christian beliefs, it was a response to both modernism and crises of the time like the First World War, with the war having an added effect of stimulating anti-German sentiments, who were perceived as militaristic social Darwinist groups. These agitations led to the famous Scopes trial, where a teacher in Tennessee, USA was prosecuted for teaching evolution in a public school, even when a recently passed state law called the Butler Act prohibited its teaching. The trial was heavily publicized in a clickbaity way and brought mainstream attention to the modernist fundamentalist split. On top of that, galvanizing creationist attempts to pass anti evolution laws throughout the US after the court ruled in favor of the prosecution. Although it should be said that the teacher, John Scopes, later had his verdict overturned by the technicality. You would think this would be a major turning point for creationism, as not only has it returned with a stronger, more aggressive type of belief system, but also managed to block public schools from teaching evolution, delivering a massive blow to scientific thought in the US. However, they could quickly turn to the worst for many reasons. One is the death of one of their most important leaders, William Bryan, a fundamentalist of the leading voice for the creationist movement during the schism. Bryan had condemned evolution for years as godless and immoral, with his career as a politician and Presbyterian elder granting recognition and respect for many in the traditionist crowd. So much recognition, in fact, that he was a part of the prosecution in the Scopes trial, trying to condemn both Scopes and evolution. After his death, it was hard for Christians to find enough leader to replace him, leading to little victories and then public education. At the same time, the movement started having internal disagreements over what interpretation of the creation was correct, with the old Earth and the younger Earth adherents finding among themselves and destroying their own organizations. That's not even counting the external pressure from more progressive churches and movements, which like creationism and by extension fundamentalism has backwards and narrow-minded and tribalistic movements that stubbornly refuse reality in the face of change. The Scopes trial from the start has been carried on in a manner exactly fitted to the anti-evolution law and the simian imbecility element. There hasn't been the slightest pretense of the court. The rustic judge, a candidate for re-election, has postured the yoke with like a clown in a ten-cent sideshow, and almost everywhere his error has been an undisguised appeal to the prejudices and superstitions. The chief prosecuting attorney, 
getting like a competent lawyer and a man of some respect, ended like a convert and a Billy Sunday revival. It fell to him, finally, in a clear and stunning statement's theory of justice prevailing under fundamentalism. What he said in brief was that a man accused of infidelity had no rights whatever under Tennessee law. So even though Christians managed to keep evolution out of schools, for decades they just... I don't know... Snort cocaine? The whole cocaine of Christ? Not much to do without television. Speaking of... I wish to reach the widest possible audience. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Bill, what do you think of it? After World War II, the United States experienced an economic boom that stimulated the expansion of new technologies, which is just many scientific breakthroughs to the average Joe. Electronics like the television would become a staple of middle class America, at the same time that the country's top scientists were developing many of the electronic components as computers, as well as researching other potential applications of the atom. Of course, this increased interest in science and technology wasn't solely because of the state of well being of the nation. This was during the Cold War. When the US and the Soviet Union were squaring off against each other through indirect means to prove the superiority of their respective ideologies. The field of science was one of them, and what really kicked the US's desire to one up the Soviets was the launch of the Sputnik satellite in 1957. Realizing that, compared to the USSR, the United States was severely behind in fields like physics and mathematics, the US government started financing scientific and educational efforts to modernize the country. This led to the formation of programs such as the Biological Science Curriculum Study that taught evolution as a scientific theory on the federal level. This led to the revival of the creationist movement, again, as they fought to keep evolution out of schools, mainly by focusing on old state anti-evolution laws. Problem is, the fundamentalists couldn't just reuse the same religious arguments they had before. The title was against this sort of approach as the need for modernization made science too invaluable to just throw away. So, the creationists conceded in certain areas and started adopting more scientific explanations for why humans walked the dinosaurs 6,000 years ago. By scientific, I mean fancier, more technical words, by the way. There's nothing scientific about this. They removed some biblical references here and there, but at the end of the day, it still was and is creationism. Creation science, as it's called, tries to explain what the Bible is true based on scientific arguments, mostly denying evolution, modern geology, modern cosmology, etc. Most of the time they used the same religious bulletin points as all of the previous creationist attempts did. They did try to popularize some new ideas, or rather some old ideas that didn't pick up steam in fundamentalist circles. The idea that the biblical world where flood affected both the formation of landforms as well as the creation of fossils was proposed by scientists in the 18th to early 19th century, until progress in the study of paleontology and stratigraphy left to the acceptance of the principle of uniformitarianism, which in geology means that the earth changes gradually over time with some natural catastrophes happening occasionally. While uniformitarianism became part of the scientific consensus, the theories connecting the Bible with the formation of the earth's crust influenced some small circles, like creationist George Price's group in the 20s to 1940s, to adopt flood geology in their views. Views that would later be popularized by two authors in the 60s, Henry Morris and John Whitcomb Jr. Having read Price's works, Morris and Whitcomb published the Genesis Flood in 1961, which breathed new life into the creation movement with its pseudoscientific arguments of a six-day creation, geology based on the biblical flood, and the direct interference of Yahweh in the creation of every living being. Including dinosaurs. That's why I keep mentioning them throughout the video. Their newfound popularity led them to create many organizations to quickly promote creationist textbooks for schools, entering into a competition against biology books that taught evolution. They restarted the drafting of law bills to ensure that, even if evolution was still mandatory for public school curriculum, creationism and creation science could still be taught, masking it as an alternative theory to evolution in an attempt to muddle the waters and so the religious as scientific and the scientific as religious. These cases were brought up many times in American courts with the judicial system declaring almost always that creation science, creationism, and all their variants were not science and in fact they are to be considered an attempt to advance a religious view inside schools, which is unconstitutional and violates the segregation between state and church. While there were cases where the court basically said, well, I mean, you can teach it if you do it properly, equal time for both creation science and evolution, these were quickly struck down. But I think that's enough about the US for now. Other parts of the world were raised in the beginning of fundamentalism and anti-intellectualism, the Islamic world. After decades of instability and corruption in the Middle East, 
The largest caused by the Arab Israeli conflict, the disappointment of secular and Arab nationalism, the authoritarian Western connected elites that were disconnected from their own people, social economic inequality, cultural shenanigans between progressive ideals coming from the United States and Europe, and the traditionalist views of Islamic reactionaries, the use of oil and money as a tool to promote extremist Islam, yeah, many more complicated factors. There was a major turnaround for Islamic fundamentalism in the 70s, 80s, when many countries with a Muslim majority started implementing religious laws that favored Islam's demands, if not just straight up turning to a theocracy like Iran did in 1979. Among these demands, like Sharia law and the promotion of religious education, the Islamists include their own version of creationist thoughts, views that link evolution and Darwinism with racist Western imperialism. If the only way to properly teach the origins of life in the universe is to learn from the Quran and its teaching of creation. Their movements led to a wider adoption of fundamentalism and creationism throughout the Muslim world, although not in a homogenous manner, as according to the Pew Research Center, countries like Iraq, Turkey, and Afghanistan have more people accepting creationism than countries like Lebanon and Kazakhstan, which has a higher acceptance of evolution. Hell, there's even a distinction between places with fundamentalist governments. While Saudi Arabia prohibits teaching evolution in schools, Iran has no issues with evolution in school curriculum as their branch of fundamentalism isn't concerned with Quranic literalism. Well, I would take this opportunity to talk about creationism in regions like Europe, Australia, South Korea. The fact of the matter is that these places have significantly smaller creationist movements than the US and Islamic world. This doesn't mean that there were no attempts by fundamentalists to fight against evolution in schools. American and Muslim creationists are trying to harshly infiltrate the education systems of many of these regions. It's more that these new creationist movements are basically direct copies of American Islamic fundamentalists, so I feel like there's not much else to explain, with one major exception, intelligent design. With creation science's failure to be implemented into public education, creationists decided to completely remove any religious reference from the rhetoric so that they could better sell creationism to the mainstream. Intelligent design therefore became the way for fundamentalists to organize and formalize all their beliefs over the years into one form of creationist thought. J just to show you how little these arguments and strategies have changed, here are some of them. The namesake intelligent design is a view that nature is so complex that only a non-specific intelligent creator could have made rules and designs necessary for it to work. The wedge strategy is a political plan to introduce intelligent design to schools, create controversy between an end and evolution, and then finally replace and discredit evolution as an explanation for the way life is created. Its goals are to turn back the acceptance of evolution and promote the view of a powerful being that is responsible for the creation of life, denouncing the process of natural selection as immoral and dangerous. Same shit been going on forever. It uses the theological argument of people like Taylor and Cicero, it uses the tactics of creationists in its attempt to fight evolution, and it has the same moral panic against the race, the barbaric, and violent cult of Darwin. I can't say this enough, it's the same thing. And what you know, intelligent design was also considered by the course to be employed by religious groups to promote their ideas, with the teaching of ID being declared unconstitutional. Still, even with the scientific and legal consensus that creationism is an invalid form of thinking that only religious extremists have adopted, Creationism has found many followers, having an influential presence in places like the United States and the Islamic world. It is heavily accepted by fundamentalists like the Christian Evangelicals and Southern Baptists, as well as Muslim Islamists like the Wahhabis and the Salafis. In these regions, support for creationism ranges from around 30 to 40 percent in the United States and Turkey, to around 60 to 7 percent in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Even with creationists believe it decreasing worldwide over the years, support from reactionary and far-right leaders have kept the fight against science consistent. Time can only tell if they manage to make their anti-intellectual views sick or not, especially with their increased aggressiveness in recent years. Now, originally I was going to discuss creationist arguments in a more in-depth manner, talk about each of their arguments and my thoughts on them. But I got really tired of reading about this bullshit. I'll admit it, I don't like fundamentalism. That's my controversial take. I do have a few opinions about these views so that I would like to talk about, so bear with me. The thing about creationism and fundamentalism overall is that basing your view of the world and by religious standards just makes you dumber. To reject new discoveries that paint a better picture of the universe and how it works, otherwise I think that random nobodies have no idea what they're talking about are valid sources of information. In creationism's case, it's a hearing think that their religious texts are 100% correct and are supposed to be taken literally. Ignoring that scientific theories like evolution and geology have produced way more evidence over the last two centuries than creationism has over its entire existence. That's not even gotten that the scientific concepts have been discussed and studied by ancient scholars and even theologians. From philosophers such as Jean Jo and Ibn Khaldun, to theologians like Augustine of Hippo, 
as well as the early naturalists like Benoit de Maillet and Charles Bonnet. The research on the evolution, the age of the Earth, and the universe, the improvement of the tools necessary to achieve new discoveries, the constant change of the way we think of these concepts as soon as new clues about how these things work appears. These scientific theories aren't just Joe Schmo down the road guessing how the world works. Over the centuries, there has been an expansion in our understanding of the world that has proven that even if they don't answer every single question we have and therefore need even more research for us to have an even better understanding of this reality, these years have provided enough concrete evidence to be accepted as fact, which cannot be said for creationism as, again, beyond the fact that it has provided zero evidence for just the existence of any deity, something that even normal religious people can prove, if you were to explain how we can know that these beings create the world and life. The proof that the Earth is 6,000 years old? That the gods created all living beings? That only an intelligent creator can make the rules that affect everything? What? Just read the Bible, or the Quran, or just trust us. We know what we're talking about, even though what we're saying is even a part of our religious texts or customs or traditions, and there's even significant resistance from religious groups like the Catholic Church and many mainline Protestants that accept evolution and reject this fundamentalist nonsense, as well as interpreting many passages of the Bible, Quran, and beyond as allegorical, not literal, because it's kind of hard to say that all these supernatural events that creatures are uh, uh, real and we're never seen any of it with our own eyes, making us look like total lunatics to anyone who doesn't think exactly like the one who's on some heavy LSD, but, but, but trust us. Let's cut the bullshit and see what creationism really is. It's a knee-jerk reaction to the progress of time and society. Like every fundamentalist movement, as well as reactionary social political ones that oppose equality, progress, and modern change in general, it's not that these things they're rallying against are wrong or immoral. It's that they're dangerous to the status quo that these fundamentalists seek to keep. Evolution and a billion year old earth doesn't destroy traditional religious values or promote Nazism and eugenics or even contradict religion overall, but the majority of religious people share both their faith as well as scientific knowledge without having a big fuss about it. The only people who think that science is wrong and that they could never reconciliate their faith with a materialist view of the world are extremists that never care that the things they oppose are right or wrong. They only care about confirming their own biases, which is why their beliefs never change much over the centuries beyond adapting to new situations like creation sciences and intelligent science small slash lack of religious overtones. That's why even with mountains of proof that what they believe in is not true, they'll keep believing in their crap that they willingly accept that there are more valid ways of thinking out there. And that's exactly how you end up in this situation where a large amount of people believe that the Flintstones is not a city cartoon from the 60s, but a realistic reflection of what life used to be in an imaginary 6,000-year-old past.